Good evening, everyone. We're going to go ahead and start our meeting. So I'd like to call to order our regular city, um, council meeting. And um, would Jessica Emerson come up? She's okay. Well, will Christopher Jackson please come up? Put your right hands over your heart. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the city of Paramount. We thank you for all that you've done here over the years and even the decades. We thank you for a shalom in the city. Uh, we thank you for cooperation between council and staff and sheriffs and churches and businesses and schools. So we thank you that we've been able to work together. We thank you for all you've done. We pray you'd give wisdom tonight to the council that they would make decisions that honor you, that bless the entire community. We pray your blessing on a staff that they could function really well as they have. And we pray your continued blessing on this city, uh, the prosperity of the city, the shalom of the Lord on this city. In Christ's name, amen. God bless you. Okay, roll call of council members, please. Council Member Lemons. Council Member Olmos. Here. Council Member Clara Stallings. Here. Vice Mayor Delgadillo. Present. Mayor Aguayo. Here. Can I get a motion to excuse uh, Council Member Lemons, please? Mm -hmm. Second. Roll call, please. Council Member Lemons. I'm sorry. Council mm -hmm. Member Olmos. Yes. Council Member Clara Stallings. Yes. Vice Mayor Delgadillo. Yes. Mayor Aguayo. Yes. All right. I'm going to go ahead and go right into our presentations. And as we've kind of been doing, um, we are. Um, I said we definitely have some special presentations. This is always probably one of, I think, our favorite part to see everything that we're out and doing into the community. So um, our community services department has, a, has actually a very special video to share. This is um, our adapt adaptive recreation program. And um, it really is a wonderful program that actually other cities have started to model what we are doing here. Um, I know that um, our community services department has received called from calls from other cities about what are you doing, how are you guys doing this, so it's a great thing. Um, and it offers activities for just, you know, individuals that have just diverse, um, different disabilities, and it provides just just wholesome fun, not just for the, for the individual, but for their entire family to do these activities together. So, let's go ahead and play that video. My colleagues will join me at the podium. We'll go ahead and continue. Wasn't that a great video? So like I said, I mean, 
Our adaptive recreation program, it offers those with diverse abilities, just new ways to have fun, socialize with friends, and just explore outdoor activities in a really inclusive environment for them. So um, it was great to see that that um, Lego night took place at our community center. So now would Christopher Jackson please come up again? So Christopher is a member of the Paramount High School Black Student Union, or BSU. The BSU fosters student growth and development through diversity. They provide an opportunity for students of all races to celebrate black culture, lifestyle, and history. And tonight, we are presenting their group with a proclamation in honor of Black History Month. So if the rest of the, the representatives from the Black Student Union, if they would please join us. They're leaving us in the pledge. Yes, so again, tonight we are presenting the Black Student Union with a proclamation. And thank you for leading us in the pledge. I'm going to hand this over. And then before we proceed with the picture, would any of you like to say a few words? Um, thank you for acknowledging um, BSU. Um, we strive to celebrate our culture, but all cultures, and be very intentional by inclusivity um, and just spreading education and knowledge about culture so that we can find more things in common um, and love one another. Um, so thank you again for having us here. We appreciate the acknowledgement. I can. Okay, ready? One, two, one, two, three. Another one. One, two, three. Thank you. All right. Next, we have the Mayor's Award of Excellence. Would John Tankledge, President of Marucan USA, please come join us? For those who may not know, <laughs> Marucan vinegar is manufactured right here in Paramount. While Marucan USA settled here in Paramount in 1974, the company's history date, dates back over three centuries. This year, they will be celebrating 375 years as a company and 50 years as a Paramount business. Tonight, I am happy to recognize John with this month's Mayor's Award of Excellence. Since joining, Marucan USA in 2007 and becoming president in 2014, John has been a vibrant member of Paramount in a variety of ways. Thanks to John's involvement, Marucan Vinegar joined the Chamber of Commerce in 2008, and John has been a board member since 2010. Focusing on community as cornerstones for their business, Marucan has hosted several open house events for our residents to learn more about what they do. Through their work with the Chamber of Commerce, Marucan is a big supporter of helping other businesses grow in Paramount. They believe that helping other business neighbors ensures the overall success and longevity for our community. John has also served tremendously as a board member for the Paramount Educational Partnership, also known as PEP. To date, Marucan Vinegar has donated $245 thousand dollars towards PEP, making Marucan Vinegar one of the largest corporate contributors in providing scholarships to Paramount students. In addition to that amazing contribution, John's staff also act as PEP scholarship graders and reviewers, helping our students even further. John is part of the Citizens Advisory Board with the Paramount Unified School District, which oversees how they expend their bond money to benefit our students. John, thank you so much for all that you do to make a difference in our community. Your passion for Paramount shows what businesses and community members can accomplish together. 
again, congratulations and thank you. Thank you. Dolly? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> thank you very much. We've got a picture in a minute. Right? In a minute, we've also got oh. one. I can go back and hold it. <laughs> <Can> <laughs> oh, I, can, I don't want that to fall down. <laughs> okay. A, a few words, if I may. Thank you very much. And thank you for, to the Paramount City Council uh, for allowing me to be here tonight, and especially Mayor Aguayo for this award. Thanks to everyone working in the city, many of which are behind me, and for making this city of Paramount such a great place to work. And although I don't live here, uh, I've worked here every day almost for, uh, for about 16 years, and I can see it would be a great place to live as well. So as the mayor said, our company, uh, Mark on Vinegar, has been making the world's finest rice vinegar in Japan since 1649, so it's 375 years ago. And if we are celebrating our 50th anniversary this year, and almost all of those years have been in here in the city of Paramount, uh, where we've really fused ourselves into the community uh, fabric. Um, we've done that by, uh, by being a leading contributor to the Paramount Educational Partnership with the uh, $245,000 over the years. And in a few weeks, uh, that donation total is going to increase significantly, I'm, I'm happy to say, as we will make a special donation to recognize the, uh, the anniversary in this city. Uh, our, our managing principle at Maricon is value people, serve people. And being from Japan, uh, the owners of Maricon, the Sasada family, believe that the fastest way for a nation to become wealthy is to give its people a chance for a better education. Uh, Marcon first gave $100,000 to the PEP back in 2009, and young people who were born that year are now in high school. We believe this generation now has more opportunities to grow for the future by being fortunate to grow up in this city of Paramount. So we hope we can inspire others to generously give to this great program. Thank you very much. I'm sure our next presentation is going to put a big smile on our faces. Would Dr. John Blake of Children's Dental Health Clinic please come up? Tonight we are proclaiming February as National Children's Dental Health Month. This is the American Dental Association's annual observance to publicize the benefits of good oral health for children. This year's slogan is Healthy Habits for Healthy Smiles. Many people are consuming foods and drinks high in sugar more than ever before. For example, in the US, an average individuals consume approximately 50 gallons of sugary beverages per year. This is why it's so important for families to prioritize their children's dental health. This month, we are presenting our proclamation to the Children's Dental Health Clinic. They are a nonprofit that provides dental services to our young residents who may have trouble getting access to such care. They are a great resource for our community. Well, thanks, Mayor Gora and uh, council members. Um, great to see everyone, um, lots of familiar faces. Uh, and I'm really glad the city of Paramount is, uh, has a business uh, producing vinegar and not soda, so that's, that's <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> um, but it, um, it's, so, it's, a, it's an honor, really, to treat some of the patients, and especially those with some special needs, um, which is really being a hospital-located uh, <coughs> program. I think that's where um, we really shine in some of the care we're able to deliver. But um, just great working with the city, and thanks so much, Joel.
Now, I know that the, the group from the Black Student Union already came up, but I actually do have something that, I, that I'd like. So if you guys would like to come up while I go ahead and um, read this. Yes, please. This is, imp this is important. <laughs> Here in Paramount, we are proud to recognize February as Black History Month. This is a time to reflect and honor the rich history of African American heritage that has shaped our nation. Black History Month was pioneered by Dr. Carter G. Woodson, a historian and educator who, in 1926, established a week-long celebration. This year's theme, Art of Resistance, highlights the artists who use their crafts to uplift African Americans and inspire the nation. From the civil rights movement to advancements in art, science, and culture, to the contributions of African Americans that have been instrumental in shaping the world we live in today. This month serves as a reminder of the ongoing journey towards equality and justice for all, and it is our honor to take part in this recognition. So again, thank you. Thank you for sure that. Oh, the individuals? Absolutely. They, okay. Do you want to do another shot with this one? Do a different one? Thank you. I think it was important that, you know, um, that we recognize, you know, um, you know what we what we had planned, and I, again, I think it's important, just like my colleagues. So um, again, thank you. So now I all have, you know, I mean, this is again, this is this is great that we get to do this. Now we have the Gateway Cities Cog Gold Energy Action Award, and would Hector de la Torre, Executive Director of the Gateway Cities Council of Governments. Please join us. Paramount takes pride in its green initiatives and efforts to be more sustain a more sustainable community. For decades, the city has been on a mission to be eco-friendly, conserve energy, and help the environment. We have been recognized for our efforts in a variety of ways. We won LA, LA County's Green Leadership Award. The National Arbor Day Foundation named us Tree City USA for a fifth year in a row. The League of California Cities has given us the Beacon Award numerous times. The South Coast Air Quality Management District gave us its Model Community Achievement Award. And now, for the third year in a row, we have earned the Gateway Cities Gold Energy Action Award. This award recognizes cities who participate in the Gateway Cities Energy Working Group throughout the year, and those who continually improve energy efficiency and produce sustainable achievements in their city. There are bronze, silver, and gold levels. I am very proud that our city has continued to receive gold status and is a leader among the other cities in this dis distinction. Hector is the executive director of the Gateway Cities Council of Governments and will present the award. Do I start the award? <laughs> some do, some don't. Yeah. Um, thank you very much, Mayor. <laughs> uh, I, I'm Hector de la Torre. I, I run uh, the Gateway Cities Council of Governments, which is just across the parking lot. Uh, for those of you that don't know, the Gateway Cities Council of Governments <laughs> is a joint powers authority. It's a, a collaboration of 27 cities and 11 unincorporated areas, roughly from East LA down to Long Beach everything in between. Um, over two million population in this area. If it was one city, we would be the fifth largest city in America. If it was one state, we would be the 38th largest state in America. But we're just a small part of LA County. 
Uh, and so what we do is we collaborate on things that spill over city lines. Uh, transportation is the big one. A environment, obviously. Um, health and homeless, uh, housing and homelessness. Economic development. And just this year, the board has approved health and wellness, uh, population health. So we will, we will be embarking on that as well. But for today, I wanted to uh, recognize the City of Paramount for being a gold winner um, for the third year in a row. That is a true dedication to uh, sustainability, to combating climate change, and to mitigating pollution. Clearly in this region, we have a lot of pollution. And so we need to do things to mitigate that. And that is what the City of Paramount is doing by improving its facilities, by having EVs in their fleet, uh, and other uh, accomplishments that will clean up our emissions in this region. Uh, I also want to give a little bit of a, of a preview uh, that for this next year, we are hoping to launch Empower in our region, uh, which is a residence-based program. So uh, the current program, the one that they're winning the award for, is just for cities. Uh, but we want to bring Empower, which is a program that's already in the Central Valley, already in parts of LA City, and in the Inland Empire, to here. And that is uh, all of the green technologies that are available that are subsidized for residents. Things like solar roofs, uh, like EVs, um, e used EVs. Um, things like uh, energy efficiency, uh, things for the home. And right now we are talking uh, to some folks about bringing a, an air conditioner replacement program uh, for window air conditioners, which a lot of people have, but bringing in brand new, more efficient window air conditioners that are installed by the team so that they're installed properly and don't you know, waste that cold air um, going right back out the window. So. Um, these are all programs that, that are part of it and some others that I didn't mention. We are bringing those uh, here to the Gateway Cities and we'll promote it with residents so that they can benefit as well. We all need to do our share. And so again, thank you to the City of Paramount <coughs> because you have done your share three years in a row and have won this great award. Thank you. Okay, would Francis Cool, partner from the Pun Group LLP, please join us? Paramount has a long history of responsible fiscal management and reporting. One of our most important jobs is to be conservative and careful with the public's money. <laughs> our budgets are balanced, and we keep a large reserve of funds to protect our operations. As part of this process, the financial department produces an annual comprehensive financial report. This document is always easy to understand and completely transparent about our finances. It is so good that it wins awards every year. The Government Finance Officers Association of the United States and Canada, Canada has given Paramount its award of excellence for more than three decades. This is the highest form of recognition a government can achieve for financial reporting. And we are honored once again for 2021-22. Francis is an auditor and here to present the award. Can I skip you guys? <laughs> You're fine. Good evening, Honorable Mayor, City Council, City Staff, and the uh, resident of the city. My name is Francis Kuo. I'm the audit partner with the Peng Group. Uh, the Peng Group is engaged to, to audit the city's financial statement from the city, uh, fiscal year uh, June 30, 2023. So in order for this, uh, to receive the GFOA award for excellence in financial reporting, a government needs to go beyond the uh, minimum requirement of gener generally accepted accounting principle. 
to prepare the annual comprehensive financial reports that evidence the spirits of transparency and full disclosure. So this is the fourth, uh, 40th year, uh, consecutive year, the city has received the award from GFOA since 1982. So it is my honor here to present the GFOA Award for Excellence in Financial Reporting for the fiscal year ended June 30 of 2022 to the City of Paramount. Congratulations. Thank you so much. And thank you to our, to our finance staff. Um, you know, we definitely appreciate the work you do. And we have staff and Kim from the finance department. If you guys can actually come up so we can take a picture with you guys. Okay, and this concludes our presentations for the evening. So thank you. Thank you for making Paramount such a great place. All right, let's go ahead and move on. Do we have any city council public comment updates? Uh, no updates, Madam Mayor. Okay, public comments? Yes, we do, Madam Mayor. We have two this evening. One is in person and one is written. Um, we will go with the in-person one first and then Ms. Luce, our, our city clerk, will read uh, the email one. Our uh, first speaker's comment tonight, uh, Madam Mayor, is from Mr. Alex Yanez. Uh, Mr. Yanez? Good afternoon, ladies uh, of the council. Um, I'm a 50 year resident of the city of Paramount. I've been advocating for handball for the last 14 years. This is year 14. Um, I'm glad you brought up finances because in the first year I, I requested that not just myself, but 50 men showed up to this council and we requested that our handball courts not be torn down. We wanted to keep our old handball courts. Those handball courts were the first outdoor recreational sport that we had in this city. Before Paramount became Paramount, we had handball courts, and we were discriminately torn down. We showed up with petitions, we showed up in person, and we wanted to keep our handball courts. Now, I had three meetings uh, with uh, city leaders, one with, with the city manager in September, uh, and then I followed up with uh, meetings with the mayor. Thank you, Ms. Ohio, and Ms. Cuellar Stallings for a, Actually, this time we actually got a chance to speak. I actually had more time than the three minutes I got here, which I am practicing my auctioneer voice so I could be able to get more information out because uh, with three minutes, you're very uh, allocated with what we could do. But uh, 14 years ago, the city had $19 million in reserves. Now they have $31 million in reserve. A while back in the meeting, they said the city said it was too expensive to build our handball courts. 
Do you know how much we would save by mental health illness in young men to avoid the crimes that they might get into, to avoid the things that they might find derogatory that you, you've come up with, uh, street takeovers, robberies, whatever it is that this cowardice uh, survey was made up with um, to slander our sport and slander the people in this community. I myself have never been a gang member, as I mentioned before. You know, now we have $31 million. We have $31 million in the city. Save it for a rainy day. You, you pride yourself on the propaganda because of your elections coming up. You have 12 events for, city, for senior citizens, 12 events for senior citizens, not one for young men between the ages of 18 and 60, not one. And you haven't had one event for any men come up here at any point in the last 27 years. Men do not longer get involved in the city because you've removed all the opportunities that we had. You removed the boxing, you removed the adult softball, you removed the soccer, you removed every social recreational event that we had where we used to gather and come together to find out what's going on in our city. And you remove that. You know what we have? We have the Latinas. We have the Women's Club. We have the Heritage Foundation. We have about seven women's clubs, all women. We have not one men club. Wait, I take that back. It was the Knights of Columbus, right? The Knights of Columbus, a Catholic school. It's a Catholic organization. That doesn't involve the rest of the community. I ask that you stop the discriminating against and rebuild our handball courts. It was the oldest handball recreational sport that we had in the city, and you discriminately, cowardously removed them. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Yanis. And now we'll go to the, uh, I'm sorry, Madam yes. Mayor, did you have a question? No. Oh, okay. Thanks. Now we'll go to the uh, written public comment. Ms. Luce. Thank you, Mr. Moreno. Uh, this comment is from Mr. Luis Rivera. And it's a little bit long. I'll read it as quickly as I can. But in case I don't make it through, a copy has been placed on the dais for each council member and staff. Good evening, City Council. I want to express my concern regarding the street parking issues, especially in the Sands neighborhood, which is where I live. As a matter of fact, I am writing this public comment as a car is currently blocking my driveway. It is no secret to anyone that Paramount has extreme street parking issues throughout most, if not all, of its neighborhoods. I have worked in many cities in Los Angeles and Orange County and have yet to see any other city facing the extreme street parking issues that we face here in Paramount. In fact, other cities have tackled this problem by issuing parking permit only in high density neighborhoods. I have seen cities like Buena Park, Anaheim, Pasadena, Santa Ana, et cetera, et cetera, issue permit parking only, helping to fix this issue. You can even go ahead and use the neighborhood north of Alondra on Gundry and Brayton Street as an example. They have permit parking only, and they do not have to deal with the struggle of having to find a parking spot every single day. I emailed Mr. Eric Wosick regarding the process to apply for parking permit only in the neighborhood. I will go on and submit this request to start a petition for neighborhood parking on this, only on this side of Paramount. However, I do not agree with the process because it is unfair. We are talking about a neighborhood where at least half of the residents are renters. If you ask a homeowner if they would agree with permit parking only, they would most likely be in favor because we are long-term residents. Meanwhile, renters will come and go and really don't care about the neighborhood. I have seen this with my own eyes throughout the three years that I have lived here. I have seen people come and go every month, some even bringing in five or more cars for one small one-bedroom, one-bath ADU. It also makes it unfair for people that have so many cars to vote in this petition because they will obviously be against the petition when they are clearly the problem in the first place. I will also like to invite you to take a drive down all the streets in the sands after 5 p.m. and see how many cars are parked in front of a fire hydrant, blocking the sidewalk, blocking the driveways, or in front of a red curb, making it dangerous for pedestrians or cars on the road, especially because of how narrow the streets are over here. This has been going on for years, and the city does nothing about it. In fact, can we even blame the people who park in front of hydrants or red curves? The city has allowed this problem to worsen, and when an accident happens, because it is bound to happen, I want to see the city take full responsibility. I have witnessed cars almost hitting other cars and children from Los Cerritos Elementary nearly being hit by cars due to vehicles being parked on red curbs, creating blind spots for oncoming traffic. I remember several months ago, this idea of permit parking was brought up in a city council meeting while discussing ADUs and how they bring parking issues. And council member Peggy Lemon said, adding permit parking will not fix this issue because whether there is permit parking only or not, 
the cars will still need to be parked somewhere. That, however, is wrong. Permit parking will encourage people to actually use their driveways. The comment continues, however, the time has lapsed. Thank you, Heidi. And we all do have a copy of that email. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and move on. I need a motion for the consent calendar, please. So moved. Second. Roll call. Councilmember Olmos? Yes. Councilmember Claire Stallings? Yes. Vice Mayor Delgadillo? Yes. Mayor Aguayo? Yes. All right, and we do have some old business. Um, this is a uh, public hearing. So um, with that, we'll go ahead and open the public hearing. Is there a report? Yes, Madam Mayor, very brief. Um, both number 11 and 12 are related, so I'll handle the report for, for uh, both items very quickly. Very a brief, as I mentioned, and then then we can go through the uh, public hearing procedure. Um, since the cities was incorporated, we've been utilizing both the LA County Health uh, Department for inspections, and we've been um, re this is related to health and uh, sanitation. We incorporate by reference the LA County Health and, and Safety Code in our code. We also do that with the County Traffic Code as well. Um, state law does require us um, to go through certain procedures. Uh, before we adopt this and one of them is to have a first reading and a set a date for the public hearing uh, we did that back in January and the public hearing is set for this evening um, so with that it is recommended to hold a public hearing and to adopt both um, ordinance um, uh, I'm sorry ordinance number 1179 and 1180 and we'd be happy to answer any questions Thank you. Um, for this one, we need to go ahead and um, see if there's any comments in favor. There have been no public comments submitted, Madam Mayor, in favor or opposed. Okay, perfect. So I need a motion to go ahead and close. So moved. Second. Roll call, please. Councilmember Olmos? Yes. Councilmember Claire Stallings? Yes. Vice Mayor Delgadillo? Yes. Mayor Aguayo? Yes. And I'll, um, I need a motion for the item. So moved. Second. Roll call? We'll need to do it each Two item. separate, yes. Yes, so this is um, for it's 1179. Yes. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, Councilmember Olmos? Yes. Councilmember Claire Stallings? Yes. Vice Mayor Delgadillo? Yes. Mayor Aguayo? Yes. That will be br brought back for adoption at the March 12th meeting. Thank you, Heidi. And now for um, Ordinance uh, 1180, go ahead and um, open the hearing. There have been no public comments submitted in favor or opposed to the Ordinance, Madam Mayor. Okay, can I please get a mo motion to close public hearing? Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Roll call, please. Councilmember Olmos? Yes. Councilmember Claire Stallings? Yes. Vice Mayor Delgadillo? Yes. Mayor Aguayo? Yes. <coughs> and now I need a motion to introduce ordinance number 1180. So moved. Okay, so there's a first and a second? Yes. Okay, roll call, please. Councilmember Olmos? Yes. Councilmember Claire Stallings? Yes. Vice Mayor Delgadillo? Yes. Mayor Aguayo? Yes. All right. We're going to go ahead and move on to our new business. Um, the next is an approval. Um, do we have a report? Hey, we absolutely do, Madam Mayor. Um, the first four items in our new business all deal with public safety. So we're going to kick it off with an idea that we mentioned to you during the goal setting session last month, and that is approval of a contract with Southwest Patrol to start conducting neighborhood patrols citywide. We're, we're proposing this as a supplement to our current public safety service. And we wanna make it clear that this, that this is not something that we're turning to out of displeasure or dissatisfaction with the current job that our hardworking deputies are performing day in and day out. Um, we're just unable to add law enforcement services during this current public safety labor shortage. And our deputies tell us that there are definitely issues at the court level uh, at the crim of, of the criminal justice system that allow repeat offenders to go back on the street again. Um, we now turn to private security as idea to act as a crime deterrent. As Maggie will now tell us, the un um, uniformed security officers would simply observe and report if they see a crime in progress. So with that, I'll turn it over to our public safety director, Ms. Maggie Matson, who will handle the item. Maggie? Thank you, John. Good evening, Madam Mayor and members of the City Council. This amended agreement for private security services is essential for keeping homes, businesses, and public places safe. While the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department 
handle public safety and emergency law enforcement services, private security services can offer an extra layer of personalized protection throughout our city. As a way of background, on May 23rd, 2023, the City Council approved a service agreement with Southwest Patrol to provide park patrols and customer service contact as part of the Community Services Department's Park Supervision Services. On June 27, 2023, the City expanded its services with Southwest Patrol to include opening and closing field space for youth leagues, reporting graffiti and security issues, and acting as customer service ambassadors for park patrons. Since July 2023, Southwest Patrol has provided a uniform guard to assist with security screenings at City Council meetings. For the past nine months, the city has established a strong partnership with Southwest Patrol. There is continuous communication between city staff, law enforcement personnel, and the private security guards assigned to service the city. At the City Council Goal Setting Workshop, the City Council discussed increasing community safety by providing dedicated neighborhood patrols for the purpose of crime prevention. Unfortunately, the city is unable to add additional LASD deputies for deployment due to the county's contract growth moratorium. However, neighboring cities like Lakewood and Bellflower are utilizing private security as deployment mechanisms for neighborhood safety enhancements. The feedback from their community members has been positive, indicating that the additional patrols have resulted in an increased sense of safety and security. There are benefits to neighborhood patrol services. Private, se private security guards can be an effective mechanism to help prevent crime by providing visible presence, employing active observation skills, and delivering proactive communication of violations to law enforcement. Their ability to patrol, monitor, and report serves as a functional deterrent to criminals and allows for a broader coverage area than that which can be accomplished by law enforcement person personnel alone. Public Safety proposes to take advantage of these benefits by expanding our private security patrol services so that additional crime prevention support can be provided to our residential and commercial, excuse me, and business communities. The amended agreement would include two unarmed security guards performing vehicle patrols from 10 p.m. to 6 a.m seven days a week, including holidays. The guards would each be assigned to patrol beats and conduct grid pattern patrols covering all residential and business neighborhoods. The initial deployment would address crime trends, enhancing the community's sense of safety and security. Preventative issues would include vandalism, robberies, thefts, street takeovers, and commercial burglaries. Their preliminary function is simply to observe and report. Under the, under the direction of public safety, the SAO special problems deputy would be tasked to work directly with Southwest Patrol to ensure that all public safety concerns are mitigated through active patrols. The guards would check in with the Sheriff's Department and be tasked to patrol specific areas of concern. Public safety will oversee their deployment and ensure that all city areas are proactively patrolled. It is imperative to note that this is an enhancement, not a replacement for law enforcement services. There is currently no additional fiscal impact on the city. Funding for this service will be offset by the unused fund for the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department Mental Evaluation Team which was included in the fiscal year 2023-24 budget. As mentioned, we cannot expand our law enforcement services due to the sheriff's growth moratorium. So the dedicated MET unit continues to be on hold. We have also experienced some challenges securing a clinician through the Department of Mental Health on a part-time basis. We will continue to work with LASD and the Department of Mental Health to offer this dedicated unit in the near future. 
As far as the fiscal impact, the cost for the two guards is $100,800, and staff has included a 10% contingency of $10,080, bringing the total of the agreement not to exceed $110,880. This contingency is necessary to provide flexibility for staff so that we may provide security services beyond the proposed contracted hours to address any additional issues or concerns that may arise. Given the effectiveness of Southwest Patrol in their current capacity with the city, along with the positive references that staff has received from the City of Bellflower, the City of Lakewood, and the Sheriff's Department, we are recommending that the city expand Southwest Patrol services to include late night and early morning crime prevention patrols. This concludes my report. I am happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Maggie. Is there any questions or comments? No. Madam Mayor, I just yes. have one. Um, much needed service. Um, what is the communication system? So is it a walkie-talkie system? So they're, they observe and report, but how do they communicate with LA County Sheriff? Yes, so they wouldn't uh, utilize any specific radios. The communication would be just like any other citizen, if they observe something, uh -huh. they are to call it in by using their cell phone. Do they call in 911 or they what? would call Lakewood Station. They would call Lakewood so, Station. And that's currently the, um, the method that we have in place right now with the security guards that patrol our parks. So we do uh, communicate with them on a continuous basis if they have any concerns, if they need uh, deputies to address, um, let's just say there's a concern at a specific park, mm -hmm. they make us aware of it. But as far as direct communication with the Sheriff's Department, it would be um, by phone only. By phone only, okay. Hmm. Any other questions or comments? No. no, okay, can I get a motion? Move, second. Roll call, please. Councilmember Olmos? Yes. Councilmember Claire Stallings? Yes. Vice Mayor Delgadillo? Yes. Mayor Aguayo? Yes. All right. So we're going to move on to Ordinance 1182. Can we please have the report? Uh, yes, Madam Mayor. Mr. <coughs> Kavanaugh will handle this item, our city attorney. John? Thank you, Ms. Moreno. Uh, Madam Mayor, members of the council, how are you tonight? Fine, Mayor. thank you. Um, the item we have before you tonight is Ordinance Number 1182 which we are asking the council to approve some amendments to the um, vehicle speed and exhibition of speed ordinance that was adopted some time ago. <clears throat> Just to give you an idea, I'm gonna be probably citing some, a lot of vehicle code sections, so um, don't get too confused by them. I'll give you kind of a general summary of what we're trying to accomplish so you understand what our objectives are. So I just wanna let you know ahead of time. Oops. As you know, back in September 2020, almost four years ago, uh, this city council took bold, decisive, and proactive action in adopting two comprehensive regulatory ordinances uh, for establishing the civil forfeiture of nuisance vehicles engaged in more motor vehicle speed contests or exhibition of speeds, and ordinance number 1135, which prohibited spectators at speed contests. This comprehensive program that the council adopted has really been largely successful due to the extraordinary efforts, efforts by both the city's public safety department and the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department. This is a team effort that really, really re was required because it's, it's kind of a complex program, but because we have so many agencies and so many people involved, um, it really has worked to be very cohesive and effective. And, it would not happen without both the public safety and the sheriff's department and the DA's office in implementing this program that you wanted to start. As a result, street racing in the city of Paramount has been reduced and other jurisdictions in California have expressed interest in establishing similar programs all the way from down Southern California at the end near San Diego to Northern California. So we, you have been pioneers in this and a lot of cities are also interested in getting these type of ordinances to combat uh, street racing. It's, it's really kind of a big problem here in California and across the nation. However, 
as with all programs, the city council always is interested in improving programs to the next level. And we have done that. Um, since the program's inception, both the city attorney's office, the deputy district attorney, public safety, and the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department have really had the opportunity to gauge the effectiveness of the program with the objective of, of presenting to the city council improved operations and additional enforcement tools. We'll go into some of those right now. <clears throat> when, whenever you have a program um, that's either even civil or criminal, where someone's property rights are going to be either taken away or seized or whatever, the law requires both in the U.S. and state constitutions that there be effective procedural due process, substantive due process, and procedural due process. And so part of this ordinance, we had to implement and put those provisions in there. So under Ordinance 1134, uh, the Public Safety Department is required to conduct an investigation as to the address of the driver, the registered owner of the vehicle, and any lien holder of the vehicle. And these people could be potential claimants down the line. What happens then is that we have to have a notice of an administrative hearing to determine the legal validity of the seizure because when a vehicle is involved in a street racing or takeover or exhibition of speed, um, the sheriff's deputy will usually conduct an arrest of the driver and the car is subsequently impounded. That car, that vehicle is impounded, but immediately we have to notify these claimants, and I refer to these three different individuals, uh, that there's going to be an administrative hearing done to determine whether or not the seizure of the vehicle is um, complies with the law. So that's the due process, to give them an opportunity to come to a hearing and secondly, that hearing has to be done by an independent hearing officer. So in other words, you can't have somebody within the city doing a hearing because there's an inherent conflict. Mm -hmm. And so uh, many, many years ago, uh, the California Supreme Court held that you have to have an independent hearing officer to conduct the hearing. So public safety has, a coord has to coordinate all that very quickly. And so under the current ordinance, the notice of the administrative hearing must be mailed to the individual no later than two days following the seizure of the vehicle. Okay, that's pretty quick. Mm -hmm. Moreover, public safety is required to coordinate with that independent hearing officer to hold what is known as a post-seizure hearing within two days of a request from the public safety director or claimants for such a hearing. Okay, so basically, there's an incident that happens. Public safety then has to find out who the driver is, the registered owner is, and the, any lien holder. Give notice out within that period of time. In addition to that, those incident reports are forwarded to my office and to the deputy district attorney who determine whether or not an administrative hearing is even appropriate under the circumstances. So this has to be done quickly. And then there has to be a actual hearing within two days. Well, it's been found that such a short notice and a scheduled hearing become a challenge to both the public safety department and the potential claimants in the attendance of these independent administrative hearings. So what we would like to do, and in order to alleviate these changes and still provide the necessary legal due process to the claimants, we're recommending that the ordinance provisions um, be amended to extend the notification time from two days to five days and to extend the scheduled administrative hearing date from two days to 10 days. It's my opinion that that still complies with the, with the substantial and procedural due process requirements under the law, but it also affords the claimants an, uh, an opportunity to attend a hearing and also give public safety the opportunity to conduct their investigative research Mm -hmm. and my office to look at everything and get this done. So uh, we're just giving a little bit more time to get that through. In the existing ordinance, um, what we tried to do is we wanted to combat um, street racing under the California Vehicle Code, and that was under 23109A and C. And that basically is your basic 
speed contests where you have maybe driver against driver speeding along racing and then you have exhibition of speed which can be um, anything run from someone um, performing donuts at an intersection by themselves in the middle of the night or um, in front of an audience or, or something similar to that. So the purpose of those two was to address your concerns that there was speed racing or street uh, intersection takeovers that were happening within the city. So we kind of confined those sections to that to that type of incidents. Mm -hmm. Under California Vehicle Code Section 23103, we have what is known as reckless driving. And that's defined as a person who drives a vehicle upon a highway in willful or wanton disregard. Willful and wanton is a legal term, um, basically for disregard of safety of persons or property. We have been told, and this is a result of the deputies uh, observing that many, many times that these drivers are participating in these intersection takeovers not only cause considerable damage to the street intersections, but also create potential hazards to the health and safety of the public. And that is, you're, you're having a large period audience around uh, the takeover, um, and you have residential people that may be nearby. So it's creating those potential hazards. And uh, reckless driving, is a section under the code that allows law enforcement to deal with that. Now, how does that apply to what we're trying to achieve here tonight? There's another section under the vehicle code, and that's 14602.7. Law enforcement can obtain a warrant to seize a vehicle when they observe committing that vehicle uh, in violation of the reckless driving statute. So. If they see somebody in their present in their presence seeing somebody doing reckless driving, doing a donut around people, and there's that, they can immediately, um, if they cannot apprehend the, the the perpetrator right at that time, but they see it happening, this section allows um, law enforcement to obtain a warrant for that vehicle and to go and get a warrant to seize a vehicle and later to be impounded. So in other words, this section of the code allows uh, law enforcement, if they cannot immediately apprehend the uh, perpetrator, mm -hmm. um, this happens when the perpetrator and vehicle may leave before the deputy gets there. The deputy may see it, but the driver leaves the scene. And so, you know, they're not gonna be chasing him, but the, the person is gone. or the deputy arrives at the scene, but the crowd creates kind of a barricade to keep the deputy from coming in to get the car, and they create like an exit lane for the driver to leave. And this has happened a couple of times. Mm -hmm. So the driver of the vehicle then leaves uh, the scene, but the sheriff's deputy see it, but now they're gone. Under this code section, they can go in for a warrant to go find that vehicle, because they've seen it, mm -hmm. and then bring it back, and they can have an impound, okay? Furthermore, if the deputies are able to view the license plate of the vehicle involved in this unlawful incident, then under Section 14602.7, they can, as I said, obtain a warrant for the vehicle and seize it for 30 days. That also can be used as part of um, a seizure or forfeiture under our code once that gets done. So what it is is that we're asking the, the council to amend the provisions to add section 23103, reckless driving, to our ordinance as a violation because what the city is doing is to, is to create additional enforcement tools. This is, if you, if you will, it's kind of like um, tools in our quiver, our law enforcement quiver, to use to try to go after these vehicles uh, when they commit these uh, either reckless driving in these intersection takeovers or such other so that they can get these vehicles later on. And the reason is because the city is considering adding software to allow for live feed, and I want to emphasize live feed on the city's current clock camera system. 
This live feed will assist the deputies in the following scenario. Number one, when there's a call for service of an intersection table takeover, which happens, uh, a, uh, a resident say, will call and say, there's a, an intersection takeover and somebody's doing donuts and there's a crowd here and it's disrupting. So they make a call for service that's actively, that's actively occurring. Law enforcement then, if there's a scenario where they can't get there right in time or if they get there and the person is gone, they can access that live feed immediately and watch it in real time, the actual intersection takeover in real time, what is occurring, and then should the patrol car be unable to get to the unlawful event before the perpetrator leaves the location. If, there, if the uh, perpetrator, per perpetrator is able to leave the scene of the unlawful event, but the camera picks up the license plate of the vehicle while the deputy views it live, then a warrant can be obtained to seize a vehicle under that code section, that vehicle code section I mentioned before, 14602.7, for violating the reckless driving. Now, the reason why it's important we're asking you to add the reckless driving to it is because law enforcement can't get a warrant for a violation of 23109 ARC. They can get a warrant for the reckless driving. So we want to make sure we want to cover our bases by allowing uh, the deputies additional tools and in using these this cameras to be able to view these occurrences live and then be able to track these cars down with a warrant, impound it, and then we would go on the regular procedure that we're doing. So what we're trying to do is um, give more teeth to our ordinance, more opportunities for the deputies, uh, not only for the deputies, but public safety in my office to go after these um, street takeover drivers, which have been very successful, but we think it, it'll give us more opportunity to get them in case they leave, but at the same time, really maintain the due process because again, there has to be a live, there has to be the ability to either see it, see it or see it on camera live. So in other words, you can't see the video a day later and say, okay, let's go after the car. It's gotta be at that particular time, okay? But it's an additional tool to allow the law enforcement to be able to get these cars and then get them off the street. So we're asking you to um, uh, introduce ordinance number 1182, place it on the February 27th agenda for adoption, and that will give us more uh, opportunity to curb and combat street racing in the city of Paramount. I'd be happy to answer any questions. We also have uh, Deputy District Attorney Kelly Tateman here. And also, of course, uh, Maggie Madsen from the Public Safety De uh, Department to answer any questions that you may have. Um, and that concludes my presentation. Thank you. Is there any questions or comments? It's over here. No. Here. Councilman yeah, Baldwin. I do. So, question. So, it says if LASD deputies are able to view the license plate of the vehicle involved, there, so they have to see a live feed, but what if like a resident catches it and gives them like a feed? Are they able to still get a warrant? Kelly, where are you? <laughs> hey, Kelly. Good evening. Um, no, 23103 uh, is a specific code section in 14602.7. Uh, um, the element of the crime is in an officer's presence. So it can't be a resident. It has to be a law enforcement officer. Okay. That's tough, right? I mean, and that's just, that's the code. That's, that's what it is. That's an element of the crime. These guys are overworked. How are they supposed to see all this like happen? These guys are too busy. Well, that's one of the interesting things about the block camera system and the yeah, potential sure. upgrade. That's another is resource. Yeah. The way, and I'm not an expert in clock, but the way it was, is explained to me is that if they're on one side of town and a call for service comes in, they're able to patch into the system. So they can, if they view it live, even on their phone, that that qualifies as in their presence. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
So they're because so, they're visually seeing it live happen yes, or correct. Okay. Yes. So they're seeing it with their eyes. Okay. Correct. Clearly understood. I'm sorry. <laughs> Clearly understood. Okay. Yes. It it is it is an additional tool that I think will be helpful, um, especially in the experience we've had where um, it, it's very difficult um, for the deputies sometimes to be on the scene right away because then they're gone or um, the audience spectators around there block them and then the car goes away. But on the by having the reckless driving. Uh, statute included, we can now use that to uh, track the car down later on and impound it. Can I just add to that why it's so important to add 23103? Because of the impound ability under 14602.7 is if an officer witnesses um, a street racing incident occurring in an intersection but can't identify the driver, then there can be no criminal prosecution because you can't identify who the perpetrator was. So a criminal action is not gonna happen, but if you're adding 23103 um, to be able to impound the car under a warrant, you can still pursue a civil action for forfeiture. How do you say that again? So you don't necessarily don't have to see the person, you, you can get the vehicle because Correct. you have the license plate, Correct. regardless who was driving the car. Yes. That's for okay. a that's civil action, okay. not for a criminal action. For a criminal action, you have, have to, to have an the identification person, yeah. of the driver. And that's a good point, Kelly. I think it's important for the council. Keep in mind that the whole purpose of the program that you all created was to create a public nuisance on the vehicle. Okay, now, um, if they stop the driver in the midst of, of, of the intersection takeover and they arrest the driver, then the DA's office will take care of the criminal aspects of it. But under this, the driver may not either be known or they can't pick him up or there's an argument, hey, wasn't there. But see, we're only interested in the vehicle. So if we get a clear uh, reading of the plate through the camera system, then the vehicle is what we're after. Mm -hmm. It may not make any difference where the driver is, and there may not be some mm -hmm. criminal action against the driver, but for my purposes, I got the car. That's why I think it's important, and thank you, Kelly, for bringing that up. Mm -hmm. Madam Mayor, may I just uh, touch upon uh, this code will definitely uh, pair with um, the comment that was made, I think it was during uh, the last council meeting where uh, one of the council members asked if there was technology um, in our city that can actually capture these violations. And I did introduce flock safety. Uh, we have been in communication with them and we hope to bring that um, item uh, soon. We're hoping uh, that we'll be able to share what we're gonna be doing and it's definitely gonna be an enhancement to the Sheriff's Department, and they will be equipped to be able to view uh, the incidents that are being recorded through a tablet, through their cell phone, and maybe even their mobile digital computer that's in their black and white unit. Thank you, Maggie. Thank you. Do we have any other questions or comments? One other uh, thing to add to, Maggie, if I'm not mistaken, um, I believe you mentioned that this was their first kind of go at it here in Southern California? That's correct. So yeah. currently, Flock Safety is uh, in communication with other cities such as Lancaster, but we would be the first to actually deploy the technology of surveillance, uh, which would be combined with the license plate reader. So um, again, we're uh, currently working on the report at this time. We're hoping to bring uh, this to you for the upcoming city council meeting. If I could just add off what you said, even though we don't have that technology right now, adding 23103 right now would still be useful because even if an officer arrives at the intersection and witnesses the car um, in person and gets a license plate, by adding 23103 today or at the next hearing, um, it's still useful. Mm -hmm. So we don't need to wait for the technology for this to be helpful for the deputies. Okay. Mr. Kavanaugh, we were 2,000 for spectators. What's the fine again for? Um, 
for the we, we confiscate the car. Is there a fine for the driver? Can you refresh my memory? Well, that's all I guess all that calls for uh, any type of fine for the criminal. Uh, this is a, there's no civil. There's no civil. Spectators, mm -hmm. because they're there, okay. Right. right. With a with a vehicle, the driver, an administrative citation is just to the driver. We can't take the car. We can't impound the car. We we can cite the driver. He gets back. He or she gets back in the car and takes off. So we'd rather be in a position to be able to make the arrest, which the law requires, impound the car, and then being able to for do the forfeiture later on or get her into a stipulated agreement and judgment with her. Okay. That's why. Okay. Okay. All right. If there isn't any other questions or comments, I need a motion. Second. Roll call, please. Councilmember Olmos? Yes. Councilmember Cuero Stallings? Yes. Vice Mayor Delgadillo? Yes. Mayor Aguayo? Yes. And definitely. All right, and next we actually have an oral report. This is the 2023 Annual Uniform Crime Report. Uh, yes, Madam Mayor, continuing with our public safety theme, we'll now hear from Lakewood Station Captain Dan Holguin. Captain Holguin will provide us with information on the 2023 crime statistics, and he'll also give us his insight as to what these figures tell us. Um, so with that, here's our Lakewood Station Captain, Captain Dan Holguin. Dan? Good evening, everyone. Uh, Good evening. Thank you, Mayor Aguayo, fellow uh, council members, for having me here tonight. On behalf of the Los Angeles County Sheriff Department and the, uh, the men and women and professional staff probably serving the city of Paramount, I am pleased to have this opportunity to give the uh, uh, safety report. So this uh, 2023 annual crime report will pertain to Uniform Crime Reporting Program, which collects crime data of reported violent and property crimes in the nation, which are classified as part one crimes. Uh, these include violent crimes consisting of homicide, rape, robbery, and aggra aggravated assaults, along with property crimes to include burglary, <coughs> grand theft auto, theft, and arson. So in uh, 2023, we had a slight increase of 4% in all part one crimes uh, when compared to 2022. Uh, we had 1,724 incidents in 2022 compared to 1,789 last year. When it comes to crimes against uh, persons, uh, we had an overall increase of 19%. Mm -hmm. We had 309 incidents in 2022 compared to 368 last year. And if we go uh, per, the, per each crime, first one is homicides. Um, our homicides, there was a 75% decrease in homicides. We had four in 2022. Last year we had one. This homicide occurred early February of last year and the suspect was quickly identified and arrested. When it comes to rapes, we had a 40% de decrease of our rapes uh, from 20 in 2022 compared to 12 last year. Of the 12 uh, last year, 10 were known suspects, usually uh, family members and acquaintances. Aggravated assaults. So if you see this, aggravated assaults, this was our largest increase in all of part one crimes. Um, this is a 34% increase compared to last year. Uh, we had 174 victims in 2022 compared to 233 victims last year. Uh, keep in mind these incidents are counted uh, per victim and, and not per incident. So one, one assault incident can yield several victims, uh, increasing the count. Also, research revealed that the uh, victims and suspects often knew each other, uh, whether it be a spouse, an acquaintance, a neighbor, or a classmate. In 2022, uh, 42 of the aggravated assaults were domestic violence related. Last year in 2023, 74 of the victims uh, of assaults were domestic violence uh, related. 
this was the 30 percent um, in total it was a 74 increase in domestic violence uh, related assaults and this is partial uh, some direction on why there is an increase regarding this regarding this aggravated assaults also 39 of the victims or 70 percent 17 percent were assaulted by a firearm or someone was shot at or a pistol was pointed at an individual or group of the aggravated assaults 30 incidents had multiple victims and this is also a factor uh, in part of, of the increase when it comes to robberies we had a slight increase of 10 percent there was 111 robberies in 2022 compared to 122 last year uh, more than 43 of these 43 percent of these robberies were classified as strong arm robberies and the majority of robberies were aggravated shoplifting incidents where the suspect used force or fear to facilitate the theft often there was no injuries or to any of the victims i'll move on to the next slide it's crime against persons a property i'm sorry in crimes against property we had an overall increase of 0.004 so we'll say we were even uh, we had 1415 com in 2022 compared to 1,421 uh, last year. Um, theft had a decrease of 22%. We had 729 uh, incidents in 2022 compared to 567 last year. Um, these thefts included grand theft, petty theft, vehicle burglaries, and vehicle part thefts, which included the catalytic converters. Our auto thefts had an increase of 26%. We had 492 in 2022 compared to 621 last year. Uh, this increase in auto thefts was seen throughout the, the surrounding cities and neighboring cities. Uh, one reason for the increase is the juveniles being getting involved in these thefts, specifically tar targeting the Kia and Hyundai's uh, models vehicles. We had arson, our arson decreased by 36%. We had 11 com uh, in 2022 compared to seven last year. Uh, there were no patterns for these fires. They were related to transients, trash fire, or vehicle fires. Our burglaries. Uh, burglaries also had a, a large increase. We had an increase of 23%. We had 183 incidents in 2022 compared to 226 last year. Uh, they were classified, um, uh, 180 were classified as commercial burglaries, and 46 were residential burglaries. Although there was an increase of 18%, uh, there was a decrease in residential burglaries uh, compared to the prior year, the overall increase in burglaries can be attributed to the 40% increase in commercial burglaries. So when it came to commercial burglaries, there was five top commercial uh, burglaries that were targeted, businesses that were targeted, and they're as follows. Um, the first one was the industrial manufacturing warehouse business. They were targeted 31 times last year. Uh, business offices, targeted 19 times, restaurants in a shopping area, targeted 16 times, restaurants in a commercial district was targeted 13, and retail goods in a commercial district was targeted 12. And most of the commercial burglaries occurred on the early morning shift. Uh, they were usually closed businesses between uh, 12 a.m. to 6 a.m. Our next, we have our calls for service. Our calls for service had a slight decrease of 2%. Uh, we had 18,290 in 2022 compared to 17,873 last year. Our 911, call, 911 calls increased by 15% uh, from 456 in 2022 to 526 last year. And our regular calls decreased by 3% uh, from 17,834 in 2022 to 17,347 last year. So when it comes to 911 calls, it's not the 911 call system that, that, that it went up. It's basically when our dispatcher um, uh, designate this as an emergent call. So that, that was an increase of 15%. And what that's telling us, we believe it's part, is the increase is related to our residents and our business owners um, being more involved in the public safety. They're, they're fed up regarding these thefts, crimes in progress. We're getting more calls uh, for emergent nature, and that's why we see that increase of that 15%. Our next is our response times. Um, our response times are categorized in three incidents, routine, priority, and emergent. Routine calls, routine incidents are calls that are non-priority in nature, usually report calls uh, that do not require an immediate response. Priority call incidents are those that require an immediate response but not a code three 
uh, response. A code three is red lights and sirens. Mm -hmm. uh, in our emergent incidents, are anything requiring a code three response? This would include felony crimes in progress, life-threatening incidents, or traffic collisions with in, uh, injuries. As you can see, we did have a decrease in our um, routine calls, a 4.6% a decrease. Uh, we, we, it was from 15.4 minutes to 48.1 minutes response time. Our priority calls had a 10% increase, 10.3% increase from 10 minutes, 10.7 minutes to 11.8 minutes. And our emergency calls, emergent calls had an 8.5, 8.3% increase um, from 3.6 minutes to 3.9 minutes. Uh, the department thresholds for response times are 60 minutes for routine, 20 minutes for priority, and 10 minutes for emergency. Uh, although we are well be below the threshold, we will, can, we will continue to work with uh, a city staff to decrease these timelines. Um, it appears the city's additional deployment regarding our community service officers responding to routine report calls and traffic uh, collisions, um, and the reinstatement of the department's SORTS program where residents can file reports online has already affected our routine calls, and as you can see, the decrease on our routine calls uh, for service. Our next is our arrest in Paramount. Our arrest, we had a 14% uh, decrease in all arrests. Uh, we had 943 in 2022 compared to 843 last year. Uh, it's not because the deputies are not working. Uh, part of the decrease may be attributed to my direction, uh, promoting uh, community policing and providing better customer service to our residents. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes, deputies respond to the call uh, with urgency and quickly handle it. Um, I told the deputies, to slow things down, uh, carefully th listen to our residents, uh, be empathetic and provide solutions to their concerns. Uh, ultimately, we wanna build relationships and trust with our residents. However, Lieutenant Morales and I will monitor our rest to balance the quality of life issues and assertive proactive policing. So what are we gonna do in 2024? I can tell you right now, we're gonna concentrate on enforcement efforts to target the increases of last year which were aggravated assaults, burglaries, and auto thefts. It's been seven weeks so far the, of 2024. Not that really matters, seven weeks is not, doesn't show anything, but we're down 20 26% already in part one crimes in the first seven weeks. Um, our SA team, SAO team will, provide, will be working with our Operation Safe Streets, Yank Detectives, and conducting targeted uh, probation and parole compliance operations of those who have criminal histories of assaults. When it comes to our commercial burglaries, um, we're already working with our crime analyst and providing our SAO team and patrol uh, deputies data of our hotspots uh, for these commercial burglaries. Uh, the team will also adjust to the early morning uh, shifts to con conduct undercover operations of these targeted businesses. When it comes to our auto thefts, we believe we can drastically decrease our thefts with community education. Um, as we all know, the Kia and Hyundai vehicles attribute to over 45% of all our stolen vehicles. Um, this is in part because of the lack of security software that these vehicles have. Uh, there is an updated software available for the owners uh, through the dealership. It's, a free, it's free of charge. One only needs to make an appointment with their uh, local dealer and have that uh, software installed. Um, we'll continue to educate uh, our residents regarding this software through social media and neighborhood watch meetings. We, and we've already reached out to one manufacturer. Um, in the near future, we will host a large scale anti-theft mobile clinic where owners can drive through and have their vehicle uh, software updated, uh, similar to the catalytic converter etching program. Um, although these clinics are done in a large regional area, I'll work with the city's public safety team uh, to have one conducted in or near the city of Paramount. With that said, we know that most of the complaints you receive from the residents are not because of part one crimes, uh, but the quality of life issues. Um, our team will balance their time and assertive uh, policing to address issues of street takeovers, illegal vending, loud parties, and traffic enforcement. In closing, I want to thank, uh, I want to express my sincere appreciation to the city uh, council, city manager, the public safety team, and every uh, member of, of the Paramount community. Uh, your dedication to public safety and support of our deputies have not gone unnoticed. Your commitment to creating a safer city is outstanding and should be emulated by all cities. Thank you for your leadership partnership and support. Uh, thank you and God bless everyone. And I can take any questions at this time.
Thank you for that. And I think before I, you know, um, open up for questions and comments from my colleagues, I mean, no, I, I think, you know, I'm looking at my colleagues and, you know, thank you. Thank you for the work you do. I mean, you guys, you know, we know that, you know, um, you guys are out there every day, you know, really, you know, we, we see, we see it, we hear it and, you know, we, we, you are appreciated. Um, so with that, um, questions or comments, I'm looking here and here. Excellent. On com side? the other side. Yeah, I do. But uh, you want to go first? Yeah, go ahead. You go. go ahead. I do you want me to go? Okay. <laughs> We're going to do rock, paper, scissors. I, I, <laughs> I've heard from um, commercial business owners that they increased the bought rate. And I like what you what you mentioned about the increase. I hope that the business owners are trying to capitulate. And I can sense who watches weekly, but day after. So I'm glad you're here. And I hope that he's hearing it loud and clear. Is there any um, programs that you offer? Excuse me, sorry. Any programs that you offer for businesses? I think Maggie might have a program where they get reimbursed if they upgrade maybe uh, lights or uh, a system. Can you please explain that? Yes, of course. So we're very um, excited to offer our business community a uh, security rebate uh, of up to $2,000. So um, any business that would like to take advantage of this program is welcome to call Public Safety and we'll uh, go ahead and assist them with the rebate pro application. Oh. Thank you, Maggie. And usually when, when we do have a burglary with the deputy, the first responding deputy writes a report, takes a report. However, there is follow-up with our SAO team, with our detective, and we do the kind of an assessment mm -hmm. of what they can do to, to, to better <coughs> fortify their business. And we always uh, recommend, the, you know, obviously the camera system that the city provides, a rebate, uh, lighting, uh, things of that nature. So we always give some kind of uh, helpful tips to prevent it in the future. Thank you, Captain, and I want to thank our deputies because they do a fantastic job. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Yeah, Captain Holding, excellent presentation. Oh, thank you. My questions were answered through your narrative, and okay. thank you for all you do. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Okay. Question, a couple questions. Um, so actually, you came back and you did answer what you're going to do in 2024 with some of the increases, so I appreciate that. Can we go back to the calls? I know yes. we had a conversation about... Um, a few months ago, we were talking about the call volumes that come in. Yes. If a person generates a call, it only clicks at one time, yes. right, for the incident. That's correct. So, so, so yeah, I think we called, we talked about party calls maybe, or is that? Just like a, a party call or just in general, if it's for the same situation that's happening, the call is clicked one time. So I'm just wondering, how does that affect the data here? So you're saying that the call volume is like down or uh, high. How do, doesn't that, that get affected if it's? If I called five times, it gets, again, reported once. So how does that? That does affect it. So if you get a call on a free incident. I think it's a mic. Your mic. Good evening, folks. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Apologize. So we get a call on a certain incident. We'll, ju we'll just say that the traffic, the traffic accident at, at, the corner, at the corner of Alondra and Paramount. Um, we're going to respond. It's, it's, it's an emergent call. The call's going to come out. We'll probably get three or four calls within one minute. Sure. But we're only going to type in one call. So those three or four calls, it's only going to be classified as one call. On your data. Uh, yes, on our data. So, so yeah, that's how it will affect it. But I, it's still, the, the ultimate goal is how many calls for that particular item. I don't know if it's five people calling. It's still that one item, that, that traffic collision. Yeah, yeah. Speaking of calls, <laughs> okay, I okay. So I just okay. I got you, Captain. If I may, just add for the uh, street racing, we are accounting the number of calls on the narrative. So please note that um, any calls in which we believe we want to track, the Lakewood Station dispatch team is assisting us right. and documenting that. So that is being tracked. It's just a little different than what is being presented tonight with the uniform crime report. Sure. I got that. Thank okay. you. Thanks. Yeah, and that, that that'll, makes sense. That'll be on the calls narrative. We have okay. instructed our dispatchers. It's, it's specifically in the, in the city of Paramount only that if you hit receive these certain calls, sure. whether it's five calls, you're going to put one call, but then you're going to put additional four callers. So that means when we look at 24 data to 20, so it's going to be increased because of that, correct? So I don't, or it wouldn't be. 
if you're adding those? Yes, no. Um, they're basically the system. We can't change their uh, dispatch system, but I know the okay. uh, the need that council wishes to know, well, how many of our residents are reporting sure. these violations. So when we receive that information, the dispatchers are actually making a note. So okay. when I review the call for service, I'm able to depict, okay. was it four uh, calls that came in or was it 12 calls that came in? So in-house, it's being managed. It's definitely not something that Lakewood Station is Report. able to provide. Got it, okay. Thank you. Okay, do we have any other questions or comments? No, Madam Mayor. All right. So this is an oral report. Some action is needed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you. All right. So we have another public hearing. So we'll go ahead and open the public hearing to resolution. Um, Ma Madam Mayor. Oh, Madam, yeah, we have one more under public oh, safety item right. number 16. Yes, I apologize. So we'll go ahead and continue with. I'm an oral report. <laughs> yes, Madam Mayor, thank you. Uh, for decades now, we've had a program called the Citizen Satisfaction Survey for Public Safety Service. This tool really allows our customers to rate the level of service they receive from our public safety officers, both sworn and non-sworn. And as in previous years, this year's numbers look really good. So with that, I'll turn it over to our public safety director, Ms. Maggie Matson, to share the, the numbers with you. Maggie? Thank you, John. Good evening, Madam Mayor and Council members. As John mentioned, I will be providing you with an overview of our 2023 Public Safety Resident Satisfaction Survey. As a way of background, Public Safety started collecting survey data of routine law enforcement and public safety services in 1997. We hope the In the Line of Duty reports give City Council a good understanding of the service quality that is being provided to our Paramount residents. Public safety staff conducts quality assurance phone calls daily. Calls are randomly selected. It is important to note that staff does not contact anyone who has been a victim of an aggravated incident. Two calls are made during the day shift and two are made during the afternoon. The information collected is then entered into a database so that we can extract this information for this annual review. The calls we place are scripted for consistency, and we ask a total of five questions. Each party is asked to rate the service provided by dispatch staff, the response time, the service provided by the handling deputy or community service officer, and to give their impression of the overall service. For the first four questions, the response are limited to very satisfied, satisfied, dissatisfied, or indifferent. The last question is simply a yes or no response. So here are the results of the survey for 2023. The overall rating, which is what we consider to be the most important, mm -hmm. it totals 99.2%. So we know that our residents are either satisfied or very satisfied with the service provided. Our goal is to measure and evaluate the data to ensure that public safety is providing quality customer service. Based on the overall rating for the past five years, public safety is pleased to report that we continue to positively meet the needs of the community. And this concludes my report. I am happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Maggie. Questions? No, comments? Madam Mayor. No. No, Madam Mayor. All right. There is no action needed on this. Now we're going to go into the um, the public hearing. Yes, uh, we are, Madam Mayor. If we could open that, and if we can please get the report. Absolutely. Now moving over to planning, uh, away from public <laughs> safety for a little bit here. <laughs> this next item is a general plan amendment, as you mentioned, uh, for the properties on Colorado Avenue just south of Jefferson. Um, we have an inconsistency here that we'd like to correct in this neighborhood. So our proposal before you tonight is to bring the general plan use designation into conformance with the current zoning code, as well as the current land use that it currently exists out there. Uh, we also revised the public notice as the council 
had suggested to us that we send out regarding this hearing, and I put a copy of that in your Friday memo a couple weeks ago. So with that, I'll turn it over to our planning director, Mr. John Carver, who will walk you through that. John? Uh, thank you, John. Uh, Madam Mayor and Council Members. This item is a request for a, a general plan amendment from industrial to multiple family residential at 15529 Colorado Avenue. We are also recommending inclusion of the east and west side of the 15500 block of Colorado and four properties on Jefferson Street and two properties on Madison Street. This general plan amendment, as John um, mentioned, will make the general plan consistent with the zoning and will prevent industrial uses from encroaching into a stable residential neighborhood, which again is already zoned multiple family residential. And this general plan amendment will also allow for the construction of five single family homes at 15529 Colorado. The Planning Commission recommended approval of this item to the City Council at its January 3rd, 2024 meeting. The City Council adopted the general plan in 2007. The general plan includes elements such as land use, housing, health and safety, economic development, and transportation. This is a photo of the site where the Five single-family homes were approved by the Development Review Board in January. These are photos of the properties we recommend to be included in this general plan amendment. This is an aerial of the site where the five single-family homes are proposed and the other properties we recommend to be included in the general plan amendment. This shows the existing general plan land use designation, which is industrial and is part of the central industrial district. This shows the proposed general plan land use designation, which is multiple family residential. This indicates the existing zoning, which is multiple family residential. And this shows the existing land use, which is almost entirely a mix of residential uses. The design of the five homes meets city standards and will contain decorative roof material, varying building projections and roof lines, a stucco exterior, and stone accents, as approved by the Development Review Board in January. This is the site plan that was approved by the Development Review Board. And this is an aerial of the project. In summary, the general plan amendment will allow for the development of a five unit single family housing project. The project will not be out of character with the surrounding neighborhood. And finally, the general plan amendment will prevent industrial uses from encroaching into a stable residential neighborhood. A revised public hearing notice in English and Spanish was mailed to property owners and tenants within 500 feet of the project area. The public hearing notice was also mailed for the Planning Commission hearing. The public hearing notice was hand delivered to residents in the project area for tonight's hearing. And additionally, the public hearing notice was hand delivered for the Planning Commission hearing. And we're recommending that you read by read by title only and adopt resolution 24004. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, John. Okay, so this is a public hearing. Do we have any comments in favor? No, Madam Mayor, there have been no comments submitted for this item. Okay, so none, none in favor and none opposed. Okay, I need a motion to close the hearing. So moved. Second. Second. Roll call, please. Councilmember Olmos? Yes. Councilmember Cuerra Stallings? Yes. Vice yes. Mayor Delgadillo? Yes. Mayor Aguayo? Yes. Okay. Now, do we have any questions or comments on the item? If not, I will go ahead and entertain a motion. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Roll call, please. Councilmember Olmos? Yes. Councilmember Cuerra Stallings? Yes. Vice Mayor Delgadillo? Yes. Mayor Aguayo? Yes. All right, so we will go ahead and move on to number 18. May we please have the report? Yes, Madam Mayor, this is time for our annual audit. This is something that we've been consistent with. 
Um, the bottom line is our books are balanced, and there were no findings in this independent third-party audit that was performed on our books. So this is good. Our books are clean. So um, but back up with us tonight is Ms. Uh, Frances Quo. She's a partner at the auditing firm of the Poon Group, and she will walk you through the um, annual comprehensive financial report. Hi, Francis. Hi again. <laughs> Presentation prepared. Is it on the... Uh, do I have the clicker? Do you help me click? <coughs> so thank you again for the opportunity to present the... Uh, the com uh, annual comprehensive uh, financial report to the city. So tonight I will go through the scope of work and talk about a couple of required communication for the audit, the overview of the financial statement, and of course the other result. So for the fiscal year, uh, June 30, 2023, uh, we performed the audit for the city's financial statement. We also performed the agree upon procedure on the after school education and safety program and the uh, uh, appropriation limit schedule for fiscal year June 30, 2023 and 2024, and also report on internal control over financial reporting and uncompliance in accordance with the government auditing standards. So some of the required communication, including our responsibility. So we are res responsible to uh, perform the audit and form and express opinion about the financial statement that's been prepared by the management with the oversight. Um, so to make sure that they are fairly presented in all material respect. And we'll per plan and perform the audit to obtain a reasonable assurance, not absolute assurance. So during the audit process, we evaluate the internal control over financial reporting. So we conduct the audit, uh, start during the summer time frame, uh, evaluating the internal control, different transaction cycles, revenue, cash receipt, uh, financial reporting, payroll expenditure, and then to see if there's any internal control issue. And during year end phase of the audit, we do substantive testing, analytical procedure, and then um, based on the internal control evaluation, and, to, and then also to design our audit, audit procedure. We also require to conclude whether there are any uh, condition or event that would raise doubt about the city's ability to continue as a going concern. And of course, we're here to communicate with those charge, charge of governance. So thank you for having, having me here. So we also comply with all the relevant ethical requirements regarding independence. Um, so when the management prepared the financial statement, there are a couple of things that we want to bring your attention. So number one, is, uh, number one is the significant accounting policy. So the city has disclosed all the significant accounting policy in the note one to the financial statements. And there are no new accounting policy that were adopted during the year. So nothing was changed during the fiscal year. Um, also, there are some significant estimates that's used by management when they prepare the financial statement, uh, including the investment fair value, that's some of the estimates, and the uh, 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 useful life of the capital asset. So that will determine the depreciation and the amortization expenses for the capital assets. And of course, the net pension liability and the net open liability. Th those are the two a big liabilities for the city's financial statement that involve actuarial uh, assumptions or that involve estimates as well. So of course, couple of sensitive disclosures in the financial statement include note one, which summarizes the significant accounting policy that management used to prepare the financial statement that will go through all the significant transactions to talk about what are the policies used by the management. And note seven and eight are related to the city's pension plan and other post-employment benefits which is the, uh, related to the retiree health benefits. And uh, related to misstatements, there were no uncorrected misstatements that's reported during the audit. We also didn't note any uh, a consultation by the management with some third party uh, accountant related to any auditing or accounting matters. So there, there's not, not a need to have a second opinion. And we didn't have any uh, significant difficulty working with the management in conducting the audit and there was no disagreement with management whether related to accounting treatment or auditing uh, audit procedures performed. So the next couple slides, uh, I will talk about the, uh, summarize some of the financial statement amounts. Uh, since uh, the financial statement is a really big book, uh, over 150 pages long, so it's kind of keeps on summarize uh, 
overview of the financial statement. So when we look at the city as a whole, we we'll talk about it talk about it as a government wide <coughs> summary. So right now we're looking at net position of the city, which is the equity account of the city. So the city ended the year with $107 million for the governmental activities. So that includes the general fund, the special revenue fund, the, uh, the capital project, and the internal service fund. And for the business activity, which is the city's water fund, ended the year with $18.5 million. So the combined net position at $126 million for the, uh, at June 30, 2023. So with that, 90, uh, about $93 million are for the in, uh, investment in capital asset for the city's capital asset, the infrastructure that you have, and $12.7 million, $12 million are the restricted, mainly related to the grant restriction, external restriction that you have to be using the funding for specific purposes, and uh, with the $20.6 million of the unrestricted net position can be used at the city's discretion. So this summarizes the city's operation for the year ended June 30, 2023. So for the expenses, uh, the city had uh, 60, uh, five, uh, almost $66 million of expenses uh, for the, to running the program, whether to for public safety, for public water, for the water. So that's the total expenses of the six, almost $66 million. And that is supported by the program revenue, including the charge for services, capital grant, and uh, operating grant at $41 million. So the net cost of service at $26.5 uh, million. And the general revenue are the unrestricted revenue, including the tax revenue, investment earning, those are not restricted. So the city had the uh, $42.5 million of general revenue for the fiscal year, June 30th, 2023. So with that, so the city increased the net position, which will increase uh, your uh, um, equity by $17.6 million for the fiscal year and the June 30th, 2023. And then you can see for the business activity, the program revenue, as I mentioned, include $12.5 million of revenue, uh, uh, $12.5 million of program revenue include $8.3 million charge for service, which is which is the uh, the water rate uh, that's been charged to the residents uh, using the water, and $3.4 million operating grant from ARPA fund to help provide some additional funding for purchase waters, and then $0.8 million top, uh, dollar also from ARPA fund to uh, putting uh, uh, related to the capital projects. Now with the general fund, which is the city's main operating fund. So fiscal year uh, end of 2023, the city had fund balance of $47 million compared to 2022 of about $30 million for general fund. So there's an increase of $17 million in fund balance for the general fund. So this slide is about the operation of the general fund in comparison to prior year. As you can see, the revenue for the general fund increased by about $5 million uh, from $41 million to $47 million. And expenditure incur has some decrease, about $4 million in a decrease in expenditure. Um, and the other financing sources and uses, there are some uh, um, financing sources and uses. And then so the city ended uh, uh, for the fiscal year 2023, there's an increase of $17.3 million in change of fund balance. So the, the next two slides are about the city's pension and other post-employment benefit. Just keep in mind, pension and OPEP, they are one year behind based on the accounting, uh, based on the reporting of the measurement date is not the same as the financial statement date. So for the fiscal year 2023, you are actually looking at measurement date of 22. So for measurement date of 2022, which is for fiscal year 2023, the city's net pension liability is $11 million compared to seven, uh, compared to $12 million in 2021. And if you, with the, the very top row, that total pension liability, that's a purely actuarial uh, calculated amount. From CalPERS, they're saying that the total pension liability increased from $100 million to $108 million, and largely, largely due to the change in discount rate. So they changed the discount rate from 7.15% to 6.9%. So with the de decrease in the discount rate, so that greatly increased the debt total pension liabilities. And the fiduciary net position, it went from 88 million to 96 million. So a lot of the government, you don't see increase in fiduciary net position in 2022 measurement date because the market wasn't doing so well.
but because the city made a contribution uh, toward the unfunded liability by issuing a pension obligation bond, so you see the $17.7 million that contributed to CalPERS actually increased your fiduciary net position, of course, with some market adjustment. So you ended with $96 million for 2022 measurement day and had a net pension liability at $11.6 million. With the funding ratio at roughly 90% uh, uh, for measurement day 2022 compared to 87% at 2021. So with the other post-employment benefit, the city's OPEC liability remained pretty consistent at $14.4 million compared to $14.9 million in 22, which is also one year behind. Um, and then the fiduciary net position went down slightly from $8.1 million to $7.8 million. So the total, uh, the net pension, li uh, net OPEC liability uh, ended at $7 million uh, for measurement day 2022 compared to $6.2 million at 2021 with the funding ratio at 52%. And the contribution made during both fiscal year roughly at $1.5, $1.6 million. So audit results. So at the end of the audit, we conclude that we issue a modified opinion. So what that means is a financial statement are fairly presented in all mature respect and significant accounting policy has been consistently applied by management all the uh, estimates as used are reasonable and the disclosure are properly reflected in the financial statement. We also did not report any internal control related matter as we communicated in the internal control letter. So with that, I conclude my presentation. I'm more than happy to answer any question you may have. Thank you so much. Do we have any questions or comments? No, Madam Mayor. Great presentation though. Mm -hmm. Where were you when I had stats class, economics? I could have called you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. And that was a receive and file. Do we need a motion for that? No, no right? Okay. So then we are Thank you. moving along. So next we have, um, this is another approval um, for traffic control for a 5K we have coming. Uh, yes, Madam Mayor, as you know from a presentation that you heard back in September, the annual 5K race is back and we'll also have a 1K component to go along with it. And that event is set for June 1st, so mark your calendars. Uh, before you deny, is a traffic control plan for this exciting event. And we're also asking for your approval on the contract for traffic control services. Um, so with that, I'll turn it over to our Public Works Director, Adriana Figueroa, to sort this all out for you. Adriana? Thank you, John. Madam Mayor and members of the council, at the September 12, 2023 meeting, the City Council approved the proposed 5K 1K event, which is um, scheduled for Saturday, June 1st. As a reminder, the 5K course begins at 3rd Street on Paramount Boulevard and finishes near All America City Way in front of Paramount Park. The 1K course begins and ends at All America City Way at Paramount Park. Our insurance provider, the California Joint Powers Insurance Authority, or CJPIA for short, uh, recommends the preparation and approval of a traffic control plan by the city's traffic engineer to ensure the street closures and relevant temporary traffic signage used during the event are safe and compliant. Since the 5K or 1K, 5K 1K event is new and requires street closures. Our contract traffic engineer prepare a traffic control plan for the event that requires approval by the city council to proceed with the closure. Therefore, this report requires two parts. One, approval of the traffic control plan for the new 5K 1K event, and two, award of contract for traffic control services. You've seen this map before at our September meeting where this event was discussed and approved. As you can see on the left image, we have Rosecrans at the top, Paramount Boulevard to the left or west, and Downey Avenue to the right of that image or the east. And of course, Alondra to the south. Just as a reminder, again, the 5K route begins on 3rd Street at Paramount Boulevard and finishes near All America City Way in front of Paramount Park. And the 1K route is displayed on the image to the right. It begins and ends at All America City Way at Paramount Park. 
Staff put together a request for proposals for traffic control services for three of the city's annual events, all of which involve street closures. This includes the 5K, uh, 1K event, the Heritage Festival, and the city's tree lighting ceremony. Having a sole contractor to provide traffic control services will save the city time and resources while ensuring the city's specifications and requirements are met. The term of this agreement will be for two years with the option to renew administratively for two one-year extensions. This will allow the city an opportunity to evaluate the effectiveness during this period. On Thursday, January 11th, the city published the request for proposals in the Paramount Journal and on the city's website. Bids were open on Thursday, February 1st. Two bids were received, ranging from $55,355 to $70,310. The apparent low bid was submitted by Statewide Traffic Safety and Science, Inc. in the amount of $55,355. The table includes the bid amount and a 10% contingency for a total cost of around $60,900. Funding for this project was included in the Fiscal Year 24 Community Promotion Operations Budget in the amount of $51,850 uh, in general funds. The total project amount of $60,900 exceeds the already appropriated amount. Therefore, an additional $9,050 will be needed for these services and can be funded using general funds. So as indicated earlier, this is a two-part report, and as such, the recommendation action is um, A, approve the traffic control plan for the 5K, 1K event, and B, appropriate an additional $9,050 from the available general fund balance, and to a worthy contract for the traffic control services. That concludes my presentation, and I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Adriana. Um, is there any questions or comments? Okay. No. Do I need two separate motions? Yes, Madam Mayor. Thank so you. So we will go ahead and so the first one, I need a motion um, for um, to approve the proposed traffic control plan for the 5K, 1K event. So moved. Second. Roll call, please. Councilmember Olmos? Yes. Councilmember Cuellar Stallings? Yes. Vice Mayor Delgadillo? Yes. Mayor Aguayo? Yes. All right. Now for portion B? So moved. Second. Roll call, please. Councilmember Olmos? Yes. Councilmember Cuellar Stallings? Yes. Vice Mayor Delgadillo? Yes. Mayor Aguayo? Yes. All right. Next, we have another approval. Can we go ahead and get the report, please? Yes, Madam Mayor. This year's budget includes uh, the replacement of the sound system as part of a multi year project improvement plan for the heavily used gymnasium at Paramount Park. So I'll now turn it over to Mr. Dave Johnson, our community services director, who will handle the item. Dave? Thank you, John. <clears throat> Mayor and Council Members. As John mentioned, um, our, our gymnasium is up for some additional repairs. Uh, this gymnasium is very important to our community. Uh, it's very important to the city. We do run programs there. We have some special events there, and it's used by the adjacent Paramount Park Middle School. Uh, the audio system, um, you can see on the right-hand side, um, you see the, the, the stack on the bottom there. That, or the, on, yeah, the bottom right, that's the original speakers <laughs> so maybe that will go in the museum <laughs> thank you I'll take uh, it. <laughs> and then you see on the left that's the control panel N none of it works anymore um it gave it it's 50 year try uh so we have gone through as john mentioned a multi-year phase to repair the gym uh you see uh three years ago we repaired the restrooms and made those really nice and then last year we completed the flooring improvements painting and lighting and you see on that top photo how nice that gym looks. What is still coming up though is obviously repairing and replacing the sound system. Uh, you see that curtain in that top photo, that's gonna be upgraded as well in, a, in another phase. And then the attic is that area that's above the storage room, uh, that will be turned into an exercise uh, location for adults as, they, as, they, as their kids play basketball, they can pop up there and, and exercise. Uh, so VidiFlow LLC is the uh, currently the primary audiovisual contractor that the city uses. Um, they've installed now pretty much all the systems throughout the city. Uh, so in staying with that, we want to make sure that we have consistency in matching the type of equipment and uh, the maintenance and support that they provide. 
Um, so we are looking at providing this contract to VidiFlow. Uh, this is a contract over $40,000, so it does require council approval. Uh, we will be using our standard, standard professional services agreement. Uh, the contract is for 47435 and I'm happy to say that is well below budget. So there is not a fiscal impact in the 23-24 CIP budget. And we are recommending approval. I'd be happy to answer any questions. So moved. Is there a yes. second? <laughs> Do we have a second? Hands yeah. down, yes, second. Roll call, please. <laughs> Councilmember Olmos. Oh, Yes. Council Member Claire Stallings. Yes. Vice Mayor Delgadillo. Yes. Mayor Aguayo. Yes. I think, sure I think Council Member there. almost really wants the speakers is what it is. Yes. I think that's what it is. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So you get first dibs on the mic? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and throw in the curtain as well. She <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> All right. Um, so number 21, actually, uh, it's a resolu resolution at 24003. Um, Can we please get the report? Yes, Madam Mayor, we received grant money from the state of California for some park improvements. And in order to get these funds, we need your approval on a resolution. And with that, I'll turn it over to our, our assistant community services director, Yesenia Guillen. Yesenia. Thank you, John. Good evening, Madam Mayor and um, members of the city council. Previously, the city of Paramount actually received um, specific grants in the state's budget for park renovations in 2021. If you recall, we've actually received $1.25 million in fiscal year 22 in the state California budget. And now once again, um, in 2023, the state of California actually budgeted specific great grant allocations of $1.85 million to the city of Paramount. So we're very excited once again. But before we can actually do anything with that money, we actually have resolution 24003 before you tonight to authorize the city to file for this application. We've allocated the $1.85 million to Parker's Park Exterior Renovations, which I'm sure um, we'll come back to you on a later date in regards to how we've been discussing how the exterior renovations are will happen. I know that AFIG and um, Sarah and our team have met previously, so we're excited to bring that to you pretty soon. Um, submit of this resolution to the State Department of Calif uh, Parks and Recreation will allow the contract for use for these funds to be used. Funds are allocated in the FY 2023 budget and our city's um, CAP budget. So with that, it's recommended to read by title only and adopt resolution 24003. And that concludes my presentation. Questions or comments? No. Nope. Moved. Second. Second. <laughs> Roll call, please. Councilmember Olmos. Yes. Councilmember Claire Stallings. Yes. Vice Mayor Delgadillo. Yes. Mayor Aguayo. Yes. All right. And now we have another approval. Can we please get the report? Uh, yes, Madam Mayor. Last item under new business is the creation of a city council committee on a community aesthetics as expressed at the goal setting session. The primary focus of this committee will be to provide staff with feedback on design options for the downtown holiday lights. Uh, future duties of this committee could expand into other areas where detailed council direction is needed by staff and so with that i'll turn it back over to you madam mayor for the appointments okay so um i know that council member lemons expressed her interest in this and i'm actually um looking to I my colleague like to express interest okay is anybody else i'm good no? okay so then um it'll be go ahead uh council member lemons and vice mayor delgadillo okay and then do we need a motion? We do. We, we need um, two. Okay, so um, is there a motion? So moved. Second. Roll call, please. Councilmember Olmos? Yes. Councilmember Claire Stallings? Yes. Vice Mayor Delgadillo? Yes. Mayor Aguayo? Yes. And just to confirm, that motion was to create the ad hoc committee and to appoint Councilmember Lemons and Vice Mayor Delgadillo to the committee. Correct. Yes. All right, and moving along. Um, so this is a little different, but now part of our meeting is we're actually going into the successor agency for the Paramount Redevelopment Agency, and I need a motion for the consent calendar. So moved. Second. Roll call, please. Councilmember Olmos? Yes. Councilmember Claire Stallings? Yes. Vice Mayor Delgadillo? Yes. Mayor Aguayo? Yes. All right, and now we have um, comments and committee reports from the council, and we'll go ahead and we're going to start over here with Councilmember Claire Stallings, please. Oh. I'd like to go. Uh, who wants to go? Okay, go ahead, Vice Mayor. <laughs> okay, Madam Mayor, along with my colleagues, <laughs> musical chairs, um, I attended the League of California City New Mayors and Council Members Academy for 2024. 
At this conference, I take away, to become a successful community, it requires effective governance and management. I feel we, the council and city staff, have always strived for excellence and perfection to become the successful community that we are. I attended our Paramount Park Playground Grand Opening. To David, Yesenia, and all the staff, the whole event was phenomenal and very classy. It was just a beautiful sight to have children and parents gathered together to celebrate their new playground. And a very special thank you to Ken Masamuto for taking all the wonderful photos, which will speak volumes in the years to come. I attended our annual 2024 State of the City Luncheon, sponsored by our wonderful Paramount Chamber of Commerce. Listening to the progress of our city, school district, and chamber was very uplifting. Thank you, Chamber, until next year. Thank you. Madam Mayor, this concludes my report. All right. All right, I'm looking for everybody. Council Member Claire Stallings? <laughs> um, I attended the same events as Vice Mayor. I just have a couple additional ones. I attended, uh, shout out to Paramount High School girls basketball. They made it all the way to the playoffs and CIF round one but they didn't make it to round two. So I would like to congratulate all the girls that have played on the um, varsity di division. Thank you, girls. You did an awesome job. You're dedicated, and your uh, sportsmanship really shows to everyone. And um, a shout-out to the lead coaches. Mr. and Mrs. Polk are the main coaches for the varsity team. Now they were in Division Four. Now they moved up to Division I. Congratulations to the Paramount High School girls team. And that's all I have, Madam Mayor. All right. Council Member Almost. All right. Um, I attended those events as well, but I think we, we did forget that we all attended the Clearwater PTA legislative um, yeah. platform. That yes, was a did. really good meeting for us to attend. Um, I think it really opened my eyes to what the school district needs to go through for funding and some of the barriers they have when it comes to legislation as well. So Assembly Member Mer Maritsuchi, am I saying that? Maritsuchi, yeah. he's the chair of education. So he actually attended and he was actually um, sharing the same ventures in a sense what's coming to the state budget that there will be a decrease this year. So as cities are not requesting money, the schools will not, you know, they're kind of in the same boat as us. So I thought that was really important that we win and actually to show the school district that we're there to support them. Mm -hmm. um, I also did not attend, but I did watch in um, the video for the, um, the Joint Commission on Retail Theft that was held, um, this is the second one that was held, the first one was held in Sacramento, this one was held in West Hollywood last Friday. Um, very interesting conversations, they actually had panels of like deputies and sheriffs and then they had the assembly members that serve on the commission for the retail theft and public safety. There was a lot of conversation back and forth and it was kind of like, we didn't know what direction they're headed in because I think it's still all new, but there was a lot of talk about maybe adding property damage um, to the charges there was talk of, a lot of talk about Proposition 47, of course. Um, they were talking about cross-jurisdiction when it came to enforcement for attorney generals. Um, again, it was just there was a lot that I didn't know, and it was really good for, for me to understand how the chambers are involved, the public, um, public safety is involved. But they talked about this program, Maggie, and I wanted to bring this to you. It's called Program Lead. Have you heard of that? Um, actually, it's, it's a, yeah? I actually have not, but I'm taking notes. Yeah, okay, now. so it's called Program Lead, and it's through the county. And it's actually a preventative um, division that helps um, to stop reentry. Um, so it's like a third option that they give to um, LA County Sheriff. So instead of going to jail or arrested, it's a third option to help them, you know, whether it's mental health or drug abuse, but they call themselves a third option. Um, and they actually go out with deputies um, and assist these, you know, people that might, might need this resource. So it's, gone, it's called Program Lead. And it was really interesting, and the actual um, advisor was there speaking about it. So I wanted to share that with you. Um, the other, I had a question for Adriana. So with all the rain happening lately, um, I was reading um, articles. Um, how do we like look at potholes? I mean, do we kind of like kind of go through because we had so much rain? Yes. To answer. To, sorry, is this on? Yeah. Council yeah. member uh, Olmos. Yes, we actually look at that as it's happening. Okay. 
throughout the rain events, our crews are out and about checking catch basins, cl clearing catch basins. Usually right after the, the rain event is when we notice them the most. The most, right. And as those come up, um, our guys are quickly patching those. Got if it. it requires more, um, if it's too deep, then they'll have to come back at a later time and fix them. But right. usually what they do is they put a temporary fix until they can make a more permanent. Okay. I just knew with the rain, I'm sure there was a lot of activity going on, but never didn't hear any issues with it. I was just wondering, education-wise. And I just really want to say happy Valentine's Day to everybody. It is tomorrow, so thank you for the flowers. Appreciate that. And that's all I have, Madam Mayor. Thank you. All right. So, like always, we're, we're busy. Uh, um, so there was a couple of things actually um, at the, we're not calling coffee with the mayor, it was the chats <laughs> next. Um, we had a couple suggestions there. Um, one of them was um, there was residents that say that they they walk their dogs at in the evening and that um, there are just, you know, people on just regular bicycles on like the sidewalks and that, you know, I mean, that it, you know, they don't, you know, watch for them and they know they're supposed to be on the street. So maybe we can create some type of safety campaign or something um, to address that because they said that they, it's, it's a regular thing that yes. they've, that they encounter. And kind of tying into that, um, there was also a suggestion for like an evening type walking club um, for people that can't go to the morning on the weekends when, when we do that. But just, um, I know in the morning it's, you know, the, it's the road runners, it's a senior thing, but I mean, these are just residents that said, you know, I mean, if there was something that, you know, we could kind of organize for just evening walks with just, you know, a group of people. So that, um, and you know, we, we said we would definitely um, bring it up. Um, the state of the city, um, it was it was really a great event. Um, there was a lot of people there. The rain really didn't stop anybody, so it was great. And it's always such a great event, not just for us to really highlight what we do and let um, you know our business community and just our stakeholders know what we're doing, but for us to hear what the school district is doing and some of the great things that they're doing as well, um, and the businesses. So it really is one of those like just top. Um, events that you know we get to all come together and it helps people that are not from our city that come in to see how we work together and how we are just a team um, so there was that and um, the other thing is I'm gonna look at Adriana and again thank the public works team because they have been so busy today um, so I don't know if you know if you know I mean it, those of us that kind of drive around the city our city got hit really hard with graffiti um, overnight and so I sent Adriana, I mean, I, I was c calling her in the morning and I was texting her and my kids send me pictures now. They're like, mom, this is, so if the residents see that, I mean, go to the app and report it, call it in because it just, I mean, we can't be everywhere at once because I know I got to a point that I was like, okay, I'd better go home or I'm gonna be late to you know my next thing. But um, thank you because we take pride in, you know, I say, yeah, graffiti and Paramount, it doesn't last 24 hours. Um, it's rare when it is up oh, more than a few hours, really. So please really, you know, thank the team and uh, for that. And for, I mean, during the rain, I, I know we were saying that they were out there and they were kind of on call. Um, I think a few, few days before, you know, we saw the images of them filling sandbags and, you know, that type of thing. So really thank them. I know that, you know, they, they've, they've been busy. They've been really busy. So um, I think that is... That is all I have. So yeah. um, comments from staff. Yes, Madam Mayor. Um, just a couple things um, in regards to what you're saying. Um, we are going to do a social media a post very soon about all the hard work our public works guys did um, during the rains and even patching, uh, patching potholes mm. in the rain. So, so we will have that uh, with the uh, added um, information about how to report them because we definitely need, need the help, so. And then also, um, we had an earthquake, um, and I'm gonna turn it over to our assistant city manager, um, Andrew Villapando, to tell you a little bit about Nixel and how that worked. Andrew? Thank you, John. Uh, yes, I'll just spend a, just a few seconds speaking about a very important communications tool that we have. Um, we spend a lot of time uh, talking about all the great things we do in our city, and we have a lot of uh, communications channels that we use, like our Instagram and Facebook. Um, and fortunately, we don't have to 
uh, use this other one as much as we need to, um, which we primarily use for emergencies and to uh, communicate with our residents about urgent matters happening in the city. Um, Nixle, it's spelled N-I-X-L-E, uh, it's an important communications tool that we use. Um, as John mentioned, on Friday we had a 4.5 uh, magnitude earthquake centered in the Malibu area. Um, we, the city of Paramount, we uh, issued a Nixle alert um, to all of the subscribers. Um, Nixle allows residents to receive these notifications via text message or email or phone call. Um, so I just kind of want to plug that. Uh, we'll be sending out targeted messages on our social media encouraging residents uh, to subscribe um, just because of the uh, importance of a uh, communications tool like that. So I'll just rattle off a few ways uh, just for the record. Uh, you can text our zip code 90723 to 888777 888 uh, to register. Or you can visit our city website at paramountcity.com. Under the How Do I tab, uh, there's a register for Nixel Alerts. And then uh, also under the Government tab of our city website, um, just navigate to the Public Safety page and you'll find um, the menu for Nixel. So, thank you. That's it. All right. So with that, um, we will go ahead and adjourn our meeting to February 27th, 2024 at 5 p.m. here at the Council Chamber. Have a good night, everyone.